You may be seated. Amen. So just before I jump in here, um, a little word of encouragement. The HVAC job is going to start July 10th. <laughs> Amen. And so, yeah, uh, they, they said they're going to take about three weeks to do that. And so it's going to be a process, but it is go- about to start. And so take heart. Amen. We have been on a sermon series, Uh, actually this is only the second in the series called Rise Up, and um, as you remember last week we started this series and talked about the spiritual state of the world that we live in, which you can imagine isn't the best. We discussed how in today's culture it's common for people to label things that are good as evil and things that are evil as good. We agreed that our country and the world has been on a gradual downward slide into darkness. And, you know, it's it's a strategy. It's a plan. And if you look at it and if you study it out, you can clearly see what's taking place there, that the enemy knew that he couldn't just bring this all at once and drop it all on us because he knew that we wouldn't accept it or receive it. And so there's been this gradual downward slide where the enemy is introducing new things little by little by little by little by little. I'm sure that um, if you went back 30 years and just looked at the television as to what's on today, you would see a huge difference, right? And so that's what I'm talking about. Just in that, you can see that there's been this downhill slide into darkness. And Isaiah 60, 1 through 3, states that the solution to this darkness is God's glory being released into the earth. Amen? It says, Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Amen? Arise and shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon who? Upon you. And so that's God's solution to the darkness that we see around us. Amen? You are God's solution to the darkness that we see around us, and the glory of God in you and on you and poured out through you and through the church is God's solution. However, we said that compromise dims the light of our witness and our impact on the world around us. Compromise, when we compromise our lives, when we don't do as Jerry just talked about, when we don't live that love out loud, to the world around us. When we compromise our lives, it dims our light and lessens our impact on the world around us. The more we surrender to God and to His plan, the brighter our light will shine to the world around us. Amen? God's order is for the local church to serve as the spiritual gatekeeper and moral compass of our communities. Hello. As darkness aggressively advances into our communities, it is time for the church to arise and shine. Amen? To arise and shine. Not to gather and hide, but to arise and shine and to go. Amen? That is the commission that we've been given. A lot of times we just like to gather and hide. Even when we go into our jobs sometimes, we just like to be quiet and hide and not make an impact on the world around us. That's simply not what God created the church to do. It's not the commission that we've been given as a church. So today we're going to talk about an interesting topic, a a tough topic, and and, um, we're going to talk about judging. And when people hear the term judging, most ascribe a negative connotation to that word. Many point out that we're all imperfect and only God can render judgment. And God is the judge, we know that, right? So the question becomes, should Christians render judgment on the world around them? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 3 through 5, because the Word of God is the only thing that can give us direction and insight and wisdom as to the questions that we have. So we have to search it out in God's Word, amen? 
And I'm just going to say right now that the, the topic that we're talking about today, uh, I have in no means the amount of time to go into the depths of this topic. We're just scratching the surface. And so if you desire a deeper revelation in this area, I encourage you to get deeper with God in his word. Amen? 1 Corinthians 5, 3 through 5 says this, For my part, even though I am not physically present, the, the Apostle Paul says, I am with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. This is pretty heavy duty. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking to the leadership of the church, right? There was an issue that had gone on within the church. And so Paul had to address this issue with the leaders that had gone on in the church. He said he was not present with them, but yet he passed judgment on a man in the church simply by hearing the report of what had happened. The leadership is told to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. <laughs> this is the church. This happened in the church. This was part of the church. This is what was happening there. And we need to take from this and learn from this so that we can walk in the ways that God has for us to walk in. Amen? Amen. There's something important about this. Bible scholars agree that handing this man over to Satan was equivalent to kicking him out of the church. <gasps> church is supposed to be welcoming and everybody's supposed to love everybody. Yeah, we are. But what is love? You have to ask yourself that question. What is love? Is love to just let people go on in their sin and die and go to hell? Is that love? Then how ought we to love one another? And so here they addressed a situation. Obviously, they had already approached this man, spoken to him over and over and over again, and given him an opportunity to repent. I'm sure that this had happened. It didn't go into all the details here, but I'm sure that that happened. I'm sure that they had already approached him, given him an opportunity to turn from his sins, a chance to admit it and quit it. Right? That's what we need to do. When, 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 when there's sin in our life and when God opens our eyes to that sin in our lives, that's what we need to do. Admit it and quit it. And it's not always that easy. Sometimes there's a process that's involved, but what I'm saying is that you can't keep going on and on and on and on in your sin and expect God's blessing in your life. It just simply doesn't happen that way. Apparently, this man chose to continue in his sin. And even with this rough language that we heard them talking about here. What was the hope that Paul gave at the end? Did you hear that? What he was saying at the end of that? That his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. We're going to hand him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. You see, all judgment in God's eyes is done to elicit a change of heart, mind, and lifestyle in order to save souls. Amen? It's meant for life, not for death. It's meant for blessing, not for curse. It's meant to help people and to shake people out of the place that they're at so that they can come into the place that God has prepared for them. God wants to bless people, but sin gets in the way of that blessing. And so it has to be addressed in people's lives. Again, this person was living an immoral lifestyle and attending church thinking that it was perfectly fine. Woohoo! The action of the church leadership made the person realize that living this way was not okay. I don't know. Maybe they didn't realize it. Maybe they were just offended and went and spoke ugly about the church. I've heard that before. The church was just evil, and we, we, they just you know, were unkind, and they weren't loving. and they Really, they were just addressing something in your life, trying to help you to, to get victory over that thing so that you could experience and enjoy the blessings of God. Amen? 
That's what that is. Maybe you saw it in a different way, and I know the enemy can do that. He can blind our eyes, and he can get us prideful, and he can get us offended, and he can have us stand off, but then we lose the blessing of God. And so the church is, is supposed to give people an understanding of what sin is and lead them in the way of righteousness, amen, so that they can be blessed and experience God's presence in a more powerful way. I know that there's nobody perfect in this room. However, there's a big difference between being okay with your sin as opposed to fighting to gain victory over it, amen? Battling on a daily basis, taking up your cross and dying daily, amen, to this world. And God says that through the power of the Holy Spirit in us, he's given us victory over sin, amen? And so when we learn to align with him and receive his power and his strength, I don't know about you, but I read somewhere in the Bible that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? And so we need to be fighting this battle together, and that's why we're here at Transformation Church. We're not here to put anybody down. We're not here to judge them in, improperly or incorrectly. We're here to take you by the hand and lead you into light. Amen? Lead you into life. Amen? Amen? We want to help you to, to battle that thing. We want to help you to get victory over those things in your life. But we just can't ignore them and pretend like it's okay. We have to address things in our lives. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, we're going to read here in a minute. But I just want us to know that judgment is meant to send a message on an individual or a group, to an individual or a group that their behavior is not okay, so that they can repent, turn from their wicked ways, and put their faith in Christ. Amen? 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 11, a little further down in this same passage. The Apostle Paul said, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of the world who are immoral, or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters. Not the people in the world. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. This is Bible. This is the Apostle Paul telling those in the church that if somebody is living in sin and they know that they're living in sin but they choose to continue to live in sin, have nothing to do with them. Nothing. So again, he's not talking about the people outside of the church because he recognizes that they're heathen, they're sinners, and that's what they do, they sin. And so we don't go wagging the finger at people who are in sin. No. We do shine a light to them, right? But it's the people inside the church that should be living for his glory, that are already aware of the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins. They've already received Jesus into their lives, right? And yet they flippantly go around sinning over and over and over again. The Bible says that you crucify Christ again and again and again with your lifestyles. Let me just tell you, you are meant for so much more than that. You are meant for so much more than that. God created you with a purpose in mind. God created you to live up here, not down here. God's calling you up, calling you up, and none of us are perfect, but all of us should be forgetting what lies behind and pressing forward to what lies ahead and stretching out to God and letting him challenge us in the areas of our lives so that we can come closer to him and so that our light can shine brighter to the world around us. This is what we need in today's culture. This is what we need in today's society. This is what we need in today's world. Where are you, church? Where are you, church? Where's your light? Is your light shining bright for the world to see? John 7.24 says, Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. The context here was when Jesus 
healed on the Sabbath, and the religious leaders judged him. He told them that they circumcise children on the Sabbath, but they get mad at him when he heals somebody. And so they weren't judging correctly. Notice how he didn't say, don't judge. He said, judge correctly. There's a difference. What I want to point out again is that he didn't say don't judge. He said judge correctly. One important function of the church is to judge between right and wrong and to render those judgments. The Bible tells us about judging between right and wrong, right? It says that, that, that there were certain people within the church that were, still needed milk, even though they had been saved and been Christians for a long time and been in the church a long time. They still needed milk because they weren't ready for the meat of God's word. And it talked about how it's God's word that helps us. It's constant use, constant study of God's word that helps us to discern between good and evil, Constant use of God's word, constant study of God's word that helps us to discern between good and evil. And if you're not going after God and his word, then you're never going to be able to discern between good and evil. And if you can't discern between good and evil, how can you be a Christian? How can you be a light? How can you be what God has called you to be? God's drawing you up higher with him. He loves you. He has so much in store for you. But you just have to run after him to get a hold of what God wants to give you. We need to judge between right and wrong. Anytime we judge, we should do so with soberness and an under, understand that it's no small thing in God's eyes. We don't just do it flippantly. We don't just aim it at people that we don't like. When we judge, it should be done following many tear-filled prayers for the person or the people involved. When we judge, it should be with a spirit of humility. When we judge, it should be sharing the truth in love. Our number one motive should be to help the person or the people to be rescued from an eternity of darkness. We do not want to be among those who are judging others incorrectly or with wrong motives. I don't want to be that person. I don't want to touch that. I want to make sure I have a pure heart and pure motives anytime that God sends me to speak a word to somebody. A word of correction, a word of rebuke, a word of whatever that word is, because the Bible talks about those things. I don't know if you know that or not, but the Bible talks about those things, and so if God's going to send me to that, man, I, I'm going to come. The Bible talk, talks about working out our salvation and with fear and trembling. When I go to give somebody a word like that, I'm going to go with fear and trembling, knowing that God is watching over me, and that if God is the one who put this thing in me, then God's going to cause it to flourish when it comes forth, Amen to hit the spot, to minister life to somebody, not to discourage them, not to beat them down, but to lift them up and to bless them and to help them. That's the heart of correction. That's the heart of judging. We want to share the truth in love. And again, our number one motive should be to see people rescued for the kingdom. Amen? So Transformation Church, this is why this is a dangerous topic that I'm preaching on. Transformation Church wants to continue to be a welcoming church that welcomes people, enjoys, avoids judging people wrongly. You guys are amazing at that. I've heard that time and time and time again, that people coming in, they felt so welcome. They felt so invited. They felt so loved because you guys are loving on people. Amen. It doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter. Any of those things don't matter. We want to love people into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. That's what we want to do. And so we don't want to lose that as a church. And so I, I, I was cautioned by even going forward with this, but I knew that the Holy Spirit wanted me to speak about this. See, these doors that we have here are open to all who desire to have a relationship with the Lord. And again, it's no small thing to discourage and turn someone away who is looking to come closer to God. That's not what we're here to do at all. We have to understand that growing in God is progressive in nature, amen? We're all on this journey in different places. We need to encourage one another as long as it's still today, right? 
We need to bless one another, right? We need to help one another. There are words of correction. There are words of rebuke that have to come. But all of that is the same. It's all for the same purpose, for us to grow in the Lord and to help one another, encourage one another, lift one another up to that next place that God has for us. We have to love people where they're at and be patient with them in this process, encouraging them in the faith. This passage says that we need to judge correctly. So what does it mean to judge correctly? Matthew 7, 1, this is going to mess up my whole message here. Matthew 7, 1, do not judge or you too will be judged. Well, what are you talking about then, Pastor Scott? Well, we just saw the Apostle Paul judge people, right? And we, we, you know, we can go right down the list in the Scripture and point out other places where this happened. It wasn't something that only happened in this little corner over here. No, it happened throughout the whole Bible. And so there must be something to it, right? But right here, a lot of people, I don't know if anybody has ever, ever quoted this verse to you. Judge not, lest you be judged. You're not perfect. Why are you judging me? And see, I believe that that's one tactic that the enemy uses to get the church to shut up and to stay over in their corner. That's what I believe. Other than maybe John 3.16, this is probably one of the most quoted verses by people that are living in sin. People who quote this verse are usually saying, leave me alone and let me live in sin. And um, that's not a good thing. They just don't have the understanding that they need. So we got to read this verse in context in order to understand it. The disciples and church leaders can be seen passing judgment, as I said. And so we need to figure out what this means when it says, judge not lest you be judged. Jesus told us that when we judge, we need to judge correctly. So let's take a look at the rest of this context in Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Be sober when you judge, because with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So how do you judge correctly? You make sure that your life is in order before you begin passing judgment on the people around you. Amen? We just took communion last week. This was the first message in this series, and we took communion for a reason. We wanted to just put everything out before God and say, Lord, help me in these areas. Help me, Lord God, to walk rightly before you. Because we, I knew what was coming here. I knew that we needed to judge ourselves, right? Judge yourselves. The Bible tells us to judge ourselves, to look into our own lives and to see what God has for us. What are the areas in our lives that might need to be aligned with God's plan and God's purpose, with God's heart, with God's word? What are some areas in our lives that need to line up with that? Judge yourselves lest you be judged. There's a lot of people that go around and their lives are a mess, yet they're going around judging other people. You ought not do that. Not a good thing. You got the plank in your eye, and you're trying to remove a little piece of sawdust from somebody else's eye. Be careful to take the plank out of your eye first so that you can see to remove that speck of sawdust in their eye. And do it with humility. Do it with a fear and trembling. Do it because you love them. Hello? Motive is so important. When God sends you to somebody to give them a word, motive is so important. Do you love that person? Have you cried tears for them? Have you prayed for them? If not, then just shut up and go home.
Anytime we take communion, again, it reminds us to take an inventory of our lives and ask the Lord if there's anything in our lives that need to be addressed. Be open to God speaking to you directly or using someone else to speak to you in your life. Oh, I lost you after the comma. (laughs) Or to allow other people to speak into your life. We don't like that, do we? And, And we can easily see when somebody tells us a word of correction or rebuke, we can easily see. What they're, immediately all the things that's wrong with them comes to our mind. <laughs> Here's what I would recommend when somebody gives you some type of a word of correction. Don't get offended. Remove the emotion from it. I know it's hard. I know that our flesh wants to jump on that. I understand that. I get criticized a lot. I understand that. I understand how the flesh reacts to that. I felt it myself, okay? But it's not going to do any of us any good for you to get offended, especially if you run out the church doors and don't come back. That's not what you do. That's not how Christians handle that, right? Remove the emotion from it. Work through those feelings, right? And then ask yourself, is there anything that I can get out of that to get me closer to God? They might not even be coming at you with a right spirit, but you can still be blessed as a result. Because there still might be some type of truth to it, even though they don't have the right motive in coming to you with it. So remove the person from it. Remove the emotions from it. And just take a look at the thing that they just said. And ask yourself, is there anything I can get out of this? I just had, yeah, I'm not going to go into that, but I just had that done. Is there anything I can get out of this that can help me to get closer to God? Because that's what I want. And so there's going to be people that might say something offensive to you. Don't get offended. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them or cause them to stumble. Psalm 163. Be open to God speaking to you Again, directly or through someone else. Try to listen. Try to apply things that God shows you in it. In the Psalms, David wrote, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Sometimes we get off and we get we get offended or we get bitter or we get we get angry with something and 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 we notice that we don't feel as strong a connection with God anymore. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence. Oh God. I don't want to be cast away from his presence. I don't want to feel a block between God's presence in my life. I want to experience the fullness of God's presence in me and through me. And anything that tries to come against me to steal that away from me, I need, to, I, need to, I need to fight against that. I need to be violent towards that thing that would try to rob me and strip me of God's presence. No matter what it is, I don't care if it's sin or offense or bitterness, anger, whatever it is, you need to fight tooth and nail to, to push that thing away so that you can continue to walk in the presence of God with a clean heart, right? Renew a right spirit within me, Lord. Keep your eyes focused on God. Allow him to wash over you and to wash all that junk away from you. It's important that we enter into this place. There's a story, and I don't have time to read through it all, in John 8, 2 through 12, right? And it's the woman, right, that was caught in idolatry, or was caught in adultery. And, and, and the religious leaders wanted to um, trip Jesus up, right? And so the religious leaders brought this woman who was caught in adultery and said, listen, listen Moses' law says that she's supposed to be stoned. What should we do with her? They were trying to trick him. They were trying to put a stumbling block in his path. Jesus, amazingly, right, in a powerful way, diffused the whole thing and judged every single person there in the process. I got to read it. I'm going to read it. 
This is in verse 2. Now early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought a woman to him caught in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman is caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such a woman should be stoned. But what do you say? This, they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. What's going on here? Amazing scene, right? Jesus rendered judgment to every single person involved. He didn't condemn, but he rendered judgment. He judges the religious leaders by writing something in the dirt as they attempt to trick him and accuse the woman. Whatever Jesus wrote in the dirt, and we don't get a chance to find out what that was, not yet, convicted them of their sin and caused them to walk away. And notice it said one by one. So he was busy. He was drawn in the dirt. And I believe that every time he drew in the dirt, he drew something in that dirt, whether he spelled something out or whatever he did that convicted each one of them in some way. And it says one by one, they walked away. There was something personal about what he was writing in that dirt that took care of every single one of them until the woman was the only one left. <laughs> this is Jesus judging the religious leaders, and he does judge the woman. He says, go and sin no more. Amen? But he did it in a way that was loving. He did it in a way that was compassionate. He did it in a way, right, that gave her the opportunity to rise up and to walk out of that life. Think about that. Finally, they all disappeared, right? And they went away. And he dealt with her gently, as we said. Why? Because sin was not her friend. Right? Sin was not her friend. Sin is a destructive force in the life of those who are living in it. Jesus was having mercy on her. And even on them by showing them their sins and pointing those out so that they could change something in their lives. To let someone go on living in sin is not love. To let someone go on living in sin is not love. It's actually hate. Because that sin will condemn them to hell. And so you staying silent in that situation is not love. Now, I understand God can give you wisdom, and he can give you direction, he can give you strategy, but I think a lot of people hide behind that so that they can keep their mouths shut and not address the problem. We need to step forth in boldness and in faith with, with compassion and love after we've cried tears for people. And we need to address things in their lives and in our lives, obviously our lives first and then their lives, right? Right? If someone dies in their sins without ever putting their faith in Christ, they will go straight to hell. The disciples confronted sin in people's lives. Peter told Simon the sorcerer, he was just a new convert at the time, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in hopes that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. That's not seeker friendly. <laughs> I didn't hear any seeker friendly right there. That was straight up because that man needed to hear it straight up. You say, oh, that was mean. Oh, that was too rough. No, that was love. 
That was love for that man. Chasing those people out of the temple, that was love because that's what they needed to get free from the stronghold that was in their lives. That's love. There's different ways that God will have us reach out to people. John the Baptist rebuked Herod the Tetrarch, a local ruler, because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all other evil things that he had done. John the Baptist was judging a person in a place of power, in the government. He was a Christian, and he was led to do that by God. We're supposed to do that. Christians should speak to corruption in our government and our world systems. Jesus and John the Baptist judged people with words such as snakes, vipers, whitewashed tombs. Most of the time they were gentle and merciful to sinners and straightforward with the religious people and the people in world systems. Because the people in systems were together and so there was a boldness about their sin about their corruption because they were together so they felt strength in numbers and so a lot of times they had to hear it more roughly to shake them out of that place and just as they judged correctly in the scripture we need to judge correctly we've been called by God to judge correctly We have the light of life living on the inside of us. And this light is supposed to shine to the world around us. We need to make sure that there's nothing in our lives that has the opportunity to dim the light of life that God has placed on the inside of us. We need to walk circumspectively. We need to walk soberly before the Lord, making sure that there's none of that junk in us, doing a self-evaluation on a regular basis and asking God to help us and, and, and to create in us a clean heart. Right? A pure heart. This is what we need in the church today. I think that a lot of times why the church is so weak today and why darkness is prevailing so much is because our lights are so dim. Because we've compromised and compromised and compromised to the place where we can't discern between good and evil. You can see it in a lot of denominations who have embraced sin within the church. We need to be shaken and awakened. See, we are God's representatives in this world, and it's important for us to judge correctly with compassion. Psalm 82 is where we're going to go now. Oh, man, we got to leave. we got to do. Wow, there's all kinds of good stuff here. Let's just hit Psalm 82, and we're going to close, okay? I'll probably throw in another one real quick at the end, but. Psalm 82 says this, and listen to this. This is out of the Amplified Classic Version because it draws things out to help us to understand. It says this, God stands in the assembly of the representatives of God. In the midst of the magistrates or judges, he gives judgment as among the gods. And so here are assembly of representatives of God, and God is giving a word, right? It says God, in the midst of the magistrates or judges, he gives judgment as among the gods. Verse 2, how long will you magistrates or judges judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Do justice to the weak, the poor, and the fatherless. Maintain the rights of the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rescue them out of the hand of the wicked. The magistrates and judges know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in the darkness of complacent satisfaction. All the foundations of the earth, the fundamental principles upon which rests the administration of justice are shaking. I said, you are gods, since you judge on my behalf as my representatives. Indeed, all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die as men and fall as one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for to you belong all the nations. God is the judge of all the earth, of every nation. God is the judge of every single person that's ever walked through history. God is our eternal judge. And here it says that the Lord appointed representatives within the earth that were tasked with rendering judgment in the earth. And it says that these representatives slipped into a place of complacent satisfaction that dulled their senses and caused them to walk in darkness instead of being the light that God desired for them to be. They compromised. 
That complacent satisfaction, complacent, this word complacent, pleased, especially with oneself or one's merits, advantages, or situation, often without awareness of some potential danger or defect, being self-satisfied. Complacently suggests that you've slipped into that place of comfort in your current condition. See, I'm always looking for God and and asking God, Lord, where do we go next? What do we do next? God, is there anything in my life that needs to be washed out of my life so that I can come closer to you? We don't get settled where we're at. We're constantly forgetting what lies behind, pressing forward to lies ahead, grabbing on to God and asking him to take us closer to him. There's always more experiences. That's the wonderful thing about God. He, 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 there's no end to the experiences that you can have in his presence. Amen? He can open your eyes over and over and over again and show you new things. No matter how much you've studied your Bible or how many times you've read your Bible, when you go to read your Bible, God can reveal new things to you every single time for the rest of your life. See, when you're complacent, you're no longer able to see your own needs or the needs of those around you. I'm okay, you're okay, we're all okay. It's nonsense. These representatives had become complacent and lost their effectiveness as representatives of God. When we ask the question, should Christians judge, the answer to this question is absolutely yes. We are all called to be standard bearers in the world around us. There is an absolute truth that needs to be told. There's a lot of people that don't believe there's an absolute truth anymore. Let me tell you something. There's an absolute truth. And you are the standard bearer. You are the messengers. You are the ones who go. Yes, you go with compassion. Yes, you share the truth in love. But you share. You don't hide in a corner because society has said, judge not lest you be judged. And you, and, and, and you, and you roll up in the corner And you make sure you don't share your faith with people because you've been told that you're not allowed in that atmosphere, in that place with those people. Bull. My Bible says go and preach the gospel to all creation. It didn't say you don't do it here or here. It said all creation. So you can determine for yourself whether you're going to be a pleaser of men or a pleaser of God. But God has called you to be a representative, and he's calling you upper. He's calling you upward. Amen? He's calling you to a higher place. So shake yourself out of the silence and begin to open your mouth with truth and let God use you for his glory and for the advancement of his kingdom. I know everybody's looking for lunch and going to the next place today. I know I'm Mr. or Pastor Scott's keeping you too long today. But guess what? This is life. This is life that we're talking about. I don't know, I know if you understand that it's not about what you're going to do when you leave here. Well, it is if you do it right. But it's about what God has called you to do, who he's called you to be. This life is for him and him alone. And if you're living it all for yourself, you missed it. It's for him. And if you haven't given all of your time, money, resources, your mind, your thoughts, your words, your actions, your life to him, you've missed it. We need to judge according to God's word. Judge rightly. Our pointing things out in the world around us should always be with compassion and with the heart of God to see people repent and to see the world's systems improve and align themselves with the kingdom. See, we are transformation church, and you cannot bring transformation to a person's life or to a community by blending in and acting like everyone else around you. You cannot bring change if you're blending. You need to stand out if you're going to bring change. We have to take a stand for truth. We desire to see transformation in our own lives, but we also desire for gospel transformation to impact the world systems around us. Right? We're going to be talking about seven mountains of influence. You might have read a book. You might have heard about this. Religion, family, education, government, media, arts and entertainment, and business. We should be impacting and influencing those different areas in our societies for the kingdom of heaven. It's just what we should be doing. The church needs all hands on deck to make godly impact in each of these areas for God's glory. Listen to Martin Luther King's quote here. We're going to finish up. 
Martin Luther King Jr. once said, a religion true to its nature must also be concerned about man's social conditions. Any religion that professes to be concerned with the souls of men and is not concerned with the slums that damn them, the economic conditions that strangle them, and the social conditions that cripple them is a dry-as-dust religion. If we're not having an impact on the world around us, what's the point? You are called, right? You're called to go out into all the world and to be a change maker, to bring truth, to see chains broken off of people's lives and to see them free. This is Christianity. Look at the disciples' lives. Look what they did. Follow them through the Gospels and see what their life consisted of. There was nothing else. This is what you're called to. We have a mandate to live out our spirituality in a way that confronts sin and engages the wrongs of society. God is screaming out to the church, arise and shine. Arise and shine. The glory of the Lord is on us for such a time as this. See, you are a child of the Most High God. 2 Corinthians 5.20 says that you are an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador represents the kingdom that it comes from. Amen? You are an ambassador of Christ for Christ. You're supposed to represent in the world around you. Are you a reflection of the kingdom of heaven? Are you a reflection of God's word and God's will? Are you a reflection of who he is? And does that shine from you to the world around you? I challenge you to look at your life and ask God, Lord, what needs to change? Lord, how can I be a a brighter light in the world around me? I challenge you to do that. And I believe that God will meet you right in the middle of it. Earlier in this message, I explained that sin is not our friend. Sin will chew you up and spit you out. Sin will send many people to hell for eternity. It's not our friend. You might say, oh, yeah, it feels good and this and that and the other thing, and I enjoy doing it. Well, help yourself on the way to hell. Sin is not your friend. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're saved from our sins. Amen? If you've never laid your sins at the feet of Christ and invited him to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior. Now, just a warning, that Lord thing, that's the tricky one. The Savior, it's all free. He already paid the price for it. The Lord one, when you make Jesus Lord, that means he's in charge of your life now. That means you don't just keep on going and living like you're living. That means you submit to him and you study his word and you find out what pleases him. And then you align your life with what pleases God. He is Lord of your life. If you've never laid your sins before his feet and asked him to come into your life and be your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray with me right now. Just repeat a prayer after me. So let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and search our hearts in this room. And you can pray this prayer if you're in this room, or you can pray this prayer if you're listening online. God hears you wherever you're at. But if you've never prayed this prayer and never received Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of your sins and for a relationship with him, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Wherever you're at right now, pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I surrender completely to you. I want to live my life for you. So forgive me for all of my sins and come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Lord, help me to live for you each and every day of the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, amen. Go ahead and clap to the Lord.
If you prayed that prayer, God did exactly what you just asked him to do. And we have a book that's coming up on the screen back here that we want to put in your hands because as you take in that step, there's going to be questions that you have. And this book called Now What is going to help you to know what steps to take next. It's going to show you in the scripture what you've just done and what you need to do next. And so we just want to help you and bless you with that. It's free of charge. They are right in the basket going out the door there. You can just grab one on your way out the door. There's a little table by the door with a basket. Grab one out of there free of charge. Take them home. And as you're reading those and studying those, if there's any questions that you have, there's a phone number on the back. You can text or call and ask any questions that you have, and we'll answer those for you. We just want to be a blessing to you and help you in your new life in Christ. Amen? And so there's this second call, and I'm going to release people that need to go. I understand. But there's a second call. As the ministry team comes up this morning, I'm wondering if anyone has ever felt judged wrongly. Don't rush us here. If that describes you and you've been hurt by that and you feel that this has been holding you back from moving forward with God, I would like you to join us up front here so that we can pray for you. Maybe some of you are battling something else that seems to be holding you back from going all out for God. We want to bring it to the Lord in prayer this morning. Amen? And so you're invited to come on up as we sing this last song and receive some prayer. One can put 1,000 to flight. Two can put 10,000 to flight. And so we invite you to come up and get prayer this morning. We're going to sing again one more song, and then Pastor Tim's going to close us in prayer. So let's stand to our feet this morning.